Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, COVID-19 and the Future of Work. My name is Ken Goldman, and I'm a program director in MIT Corporate Relations. On behalf of the MIT Industrial Liaison Program, I'll be your host this morning. Since its founding in 1948, the Industrial Liaison Program serves as a gateway and guide connecting member corporations worldwide with MIT research and with the larger MIT innovation ecosystem, including MIT connected startups. Thanks to the internet and telecommunications technology, some of which was developed by our researchers, MIT and corporate relations are open today for business, education, and research. This webinar is one of a series of webinars produced by Corporate Relations to serve our members. Details on upcoming events are posted on our website at ilp.mit.edu under the Attend tab. For the present, MIT Corporate Relations is offering these events not only to our ILP members, but to the general public keeping with MIT's mission of creating and sharing new knowledge. Our speaker today is Professor Thomas Malone, who is the founding director of the MIT Center for Collective Intelligence. For many years, he studied the effects of information and communications technology on organizations, how organizations are structured, and how information flows and knowledge is managed within them many of his predictions have come true. Today, he will share his vision of how the current pandemic has accelerated the changes that he has foreseen and catapulted us into that future. Before we proceed, some information for our audience. This presentation will be recorded and available on our website, ilp.mit.edu. Taking advantage of the features of the Zoom webinar application, you may submit questions for Professor Malone via the Q&A feature you see at the bottom of your Zoom window. They will be seen by everyone. You may vote for questions you see appearing in the Q&A to move them toward the top of the list. Use the chat only to communicate and resolve technical difficulties with our tech support team. And with that, I'm pleased to turn the floor over to Professor Malone. So thank you, Kim. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this morning, and uh, it's an amazing time for all of us to be here. We've never seen anything like this COVID-19 pandemic in modern history, and we're all living through a massive shock to our society. I think many people assume that when this virus is under control, everything will go back to the way it was before. I like this picture of the bullet train that we're all on. And uh, the question then is how we're going to work differently uh, and where we're going to work. I think that uh, the crisis illustrates that almost everyone will be working from home uh, when they can. And many people are discovering that they really can do much of their job from a distance. Of course, when lots of other things in society are disrupted too, like schools being closed, this doesn't always work out perfectly. Uh, but I think for many people, it's working better than they would have expected. And many people are asking themselves, why do we need to commute an hour a day to meet with people we can already see and talk to electronically? Of course, sometimes face-to-face -face meetings are necessary. And when things go back to normal, I think we'll go back to having some of these meetings. But I think many people will be surprised at how often, once we're used to doing it, many jobs can be done from anywhere. And that means more and more people will make decisions about where they live, not based on where their job is, but on what they wanna be close to outside of work, whether that's beaches, or mountains, or the excitement of the city. Now, this clearly has implications for real estate and real estate prices. For instance, 
I think it's likely that expensive urban office space like this will probably be less valuable in the future. But I think many people today probably still won't want to work in their own homes all the time. So among other things, I think we're likely to see a new kind of office become much more common. That's what I call neighborhood office buildings. For instance, think of suburbs where every block or two, there's a former house converted into office space. Maybe this building, for instance, would be converted into workspaces for six or seven people who had different jobs working for different companies, but who all shared a coffee machine, a chance to socialize with each other, and a commute consisting of a two minute walk from their nearby houses. I think it's likely also that the online shopping we're all getting used to now won't go back to the way it was before. If you're just buying a commodity like a loaf of bread or a roll of paper towels, for instance, I think many people will continue to do what they've done a lot during the pandemic, and that is buy much more online than they used to. So I think this pandemic will greatly accelerate the shift away from brick and mortar retail stores to online retail. But I think there will also always be a place for high-end or specialty stores that have some kind of appealing ambiance or specialized expert sales staff. I think that will be here for a long time. Another thing I think will change is our social habits. I don't think we humans are wired to be alone, but many of us are discovering that the digital world provides more opportunities for connection than many of us suspected. For instance, over the past few weeks, my wife and I have had a bunch of vid video dinner parties with our friends. We talked about politics, our kids, our latest Netflix obsessions. In other words, the same things we'd talk about if we were together in the same room. Zoom and FaceTime and those other systems aren't perfect, but I think they offer an easy, satisfying substitute for in-person communication. And I think when the virus subsides, lots of people will continue to socialize virtually more often than you might think. In fact, I think there are all kinds of really interesting opportunities for creating new kinds of digital socializing that we don't even know about yet. Another thing I think is likely to change is how students learn. I think the world has been ripe for online education for decades, and this forced global experiment with remote teaching may push it over the edge, particularly in higher education. As COVID-19 has pushed classes online at colleges across the country, many students are finding that remote learning is often a pretty reasonable substitute for what usually takes place in the classroom. And sometimes it's even better. For instance, I've been teaching my class online for a few weeks now. Here's a picture of the students in my class. And I think it's been going pretty well. There's some things you can do in a classroom that you, that you can't do online, that's true. But I think there are also things you can do online that you can't do nearly as easily in a classroom. For example, in my class, we've used a shared Google Doc to do group brainstorming. And we've instantly gone into breakout groups to discuss team projects. I think what we're going to find is that online education is a good thing to do in many more situations than we used to think. But I don't think residential education will go away completely either. For example, there are lots of things that happen for undergraduates when they live at a university. Their first time away from home, a lot of interaction outside the classroom. I think those things are important and I think many people will still want those things. So I think we're likely to see much more reliance on hybrid programs that combine on-campus and remote learning and on new kinds of credentialing for online coursework. So 
Maybe that's a good place to stop for questions. In the next section of the talk, we'll talk about what kind of work we'll do. But let me just pause for a minute now and see if people have questions. Uh, let me take this opportunity before we uh, take the questions and have Professor Malone respond to them to remind the audience, some of which have only joined us recently, that the chat feature is used only to resolve technical problems with our staff and communicates to them. And the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window is used to pose questions from which we'll select. So please pay attention to that. So uh, the first question, would you go so far as to predict a crash in the commercial real estate market? And what about urban home prices? So a very good question. Uh, crash is a pretty strong word, and I, I don't feel confident that uh, what will happen will be a crash. I do think it's likely that urban office space will become less valuable. But I think one thing that's likely to happen with that uh, office space, former office space that's no longer used for offices is that it will be converted into residences and even some other kinds of uh, local businesses to, that people in the neighborhood will patronize. So I think uh, it's, like, it's likely that there will still be a real market for uh, the office space that exists and has, was constructed at great cost. Uh, uh, it'll just not be used for offices and I think it's probably likely to cost less than the office space does. Uh, it's a little harder to predict what the um, prices for urban residents, residential space will be uh, that may go down if there's less reason we, why people want to be in cities. But I think if cities or the cities that do a good job of creating a really interesting cultural, social environment in the middle of their downtown areas, I think those cities may see an increase in the price of residential real estate. I guess that's my answer to that first question. Uh, the next question, will the increase in work from home push organizations to think of new models for remuneration of employees, cost, and allocation of resources? So uh, it's not obvious that this would be a reason to change the way we pay employees. Uh, some people will still be paid with salaries, I think. There are other reasons besides whether you're in an office or not that uh, lead people to do that. Uh, I think there will be some kinds of work that become uh, more, more paid by what you accomplish rather than the amount of time you spend on it. Uh, and I think, uh, so I think it'll change. It's hard to say whether it will go up or down overall. Okay, and I think we have time for one more question before you resume your talk. Uh, the question is, what do you think the impact would be for women? Uh, the questioner wonders that perhaps just like the aftermath of World War II, that there'll be great changes and opportunities for women. They can balance home life and work life. Uh, there's less of a, quote, boys club, unquote, after work drinks, golf course, online networking. Uh, fun sourcing could be more gender balanced. What do you think? I think that's a plausible theory. Um, I think that uh, uh, to the degree there are women who aren't active in the workforce or aren't as successful in the workforce as they would otherwise be, I think the ability to combine work and family uh, is likely to increase to the degree people want to do that. And I think to the degree some workplaces are still um, places where the physical kinds of interaction that are available uh, uh, are based on gender in important ways. I think those things will definitely decrease. I'd also point out that uh, this is not just a question for women. I think it also makes it possible for men who want to spend more time uh, with their families or participating in childcare. I think the same things that make the changes possible for women will also make it possible, make them possible for men. Thank you. Okay, so let's return to the slides then. Uh, the next thing I wanna talk about is in these office spaces that are spread out over many more places than we're used to and people working from all kinds of places, uh, what kind of work will we actually do? And I think that uh, uh, 
many of the, as I said, many of the changes that I've been thinking and talking about and writing about for years, I think those changes will be dramatically accelerated by the bullet train of the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'd like to talk about these changes using some of the frameworks in my recent book, Superminds. The first point I'd like to make is that we should be thinking less about people or computers and more about people and computers. Less about how computers are gonna take away jobs from people and more about what people and computers can do together that could never be done before. I think one useful way of thinking about that, about these combinations of people and computers, is as superminds, groups of individuals, in this case both people and computers, acting together in ways that seem intelligent. And I think one of the fundamental questions we can ask ourselves as we think about what work may look like in the post-COVID world is this. How can people and computers be connected so that collectively they act more intelligently than any person, group, or computer has ever done before? Now, that's a big, hard, complicated question. But I think one thing that can help us answer it is thinking about or understanding the difference between two kinds of intelligence. The first is specialized intelligence, the ability to achieve specific goals in specific environments. The other is general intelligence, the ability to achieve a wide range of goals in a wide range of different environments. Now, here's something a lot of people don't know. Even the most advanced computers in the world today have only specialized intelligence. For instance, the IBM Watson computer program that beat the best human players of the game show Jeopardy. That program, I know from the person who led its development, couldn't even play tic-tac-toe, much less chess. It was very specialized for the particular task of playing Jeopardy. At the same time, all humans have more general intelligence than the most advanced computers in the world today. Even a normal five-year-old child, for instance, can carry on a sensible conversation about a much wider range of topics than, than today's most advanced AI programs. Now, one obvious question is, how soon will this change? When will we have human-level general artificial intelligence? That's a question people have been asking ever since the beginning of the field of artificial intelligence. And for that entire time, an average answer people have given to the question is, we should have human level AI about 20 years in the future. In other words, human level AI has been 20 years away for the last 60 years. Now, is it theoretically possible that this time the prediction could be true? Yes, theoretically possible. But I think we should be very skeptical of anyone who confidently predicts we'll have human level AI in the next few decades. In my own view, we're likely to have that someday, but that's likely to be many, many decades in the future. And part of what that means is that in the meantime, all uses of computers will involve people. Now, one way people talk about that today is to say we need to have humans in the loop. When they say that, they're often thinking about one person, one computer. But I think a more useful way of thinking about this is to start with the human groups that have accomplished almost everything we humans have ever done and add computers to those groups. Then we can use the specialized intelligence of the computers to do the things they can do better than people, like arithmetic and certain kinds of pattern recognition. And we can use the general intelligence of the people to do everything else. Perhaps more importantly, we can also use the computers to provide what I call hyper-connectivity, connecting people to other people at much larger scales and in rich new ways that were never possible before. 
Now, I think we often overestimate the potential of artificial intelligence, perhaps because it's so easy for us to imagine computers as smart as people. Our science fiction is full of them, for instance. But unfortunately, it's much harder to construct such machines than to imagine them. On the other hand, I think we often underestimate the importance of hyperintelligence. I'm sorry, of hyperconnectivity. Perhaps because it's more important in a certain it's in a certain sense, it's easier to create hyperconnectivity than to understand it and to imagine it. For instance, we've already created some of the most hyper-connected groups the world has ever known, with billions of people connected to the internet. And yet it's still hard for us to imagine how those groups can do things and what new kinds of things can be done, even with the hyper-connectivity we already have, much less what will be possible in the future. So one way of summarizing this is to say that I think we need to move from thinking about compute from thinking about humans in the loop to computers in the group. That's my slogan for you today. So let's look at some examples of what it might look like to have computers in the group in the post COVID world. One thing I think is likely to become much more common is that when tasks can be done from anywhere on the planet, lots of new kinds of jobs will become possible. And one particular kind of new job is hyper-specialized jobs. When you can have global economies of scale for doing things, I think it will become more common for people to specialize on very narrow tasks and be one of the best in the world at doing those narrow tasks. And people from all over the world can then use that person's skills in that regard. For instance, I think there might be people who specialize only in answering arcane questions from accountants all over the country about what kinds of business entertainment expenses are deductible and which aren't. I think there might be other people who become hyper specialists in multiple areas. One might spend the morning, for instance, evaluating the feasibility of pieces of Apple's strategic plan, the afternoon estimating the probability that specific individuals are planning terrorist attacks in Yemen, Maybe they would end the day predicting the outcomes of local elections in Singapore. Well, let's look at some examples of what this kind of hyper specialization might be like. Uh, one example is a, is a software development platform called Top Coder, now part of Wipro. They have over a million and a half software developers from all over the world. And each project they do, each software development project is divided into lots of small tasks, even smaller, quite a bit smaller than the tasks that are done in a typical software development process. The freelance developers compete to do those tasks. And the key point for us here is that different developers are able to specialize in very small kinds, very specialized kinds of tasks. For instance, there might be one developer who specializes only in doing user interface software for Apple iPhones. Somebody else who specializes only in doing a particular kind of database software for Amazon Web Services, and so on. So these hyper-specialists could do those things. They're parts of the problem for people all over the world. And I think software development is not at all unusual in this regard. I think there are lots of types of tasks where lots of different pieces can be done better by different specialists all over the world, wherever they are. Another uh, example is a system called Foldit. It's essentially a citizen science project for folding protein molecules. It turns out that one of the key questions in a lot of biology and biotechnology and pharmaceutical development problems is what particular configuration a given sequence of protein molecules, a protein, uh, uh, molecule will fold into. What happens scientifically is that it folds into the lowest energy configuration. And it turns out it's pretty easy for computers to uh, estimate the energy amount of a particular configuration. But there are trillions of possible configurations to be explored to find out what would be the lowest energy configuration. And it turns out that 
computers aren't particularly good at figuring out which direction to explore those combinations. But some people who have a particular kind of visual aptitude are really good at that. They're pretty good at figuring out how you're likely to get closer to the low energy configuration like this one for the molecule we showed on the previous slide. And so what the Fold system does is create online games that people can play that involve folding these molecules or trying to figure out how to fold them in ways that will have the lowest possible energy. And it turns out there are some people who have a particular kind of visual attitude, aptitude that makes them very good at doing this task. And those people have gravitated to the folded site, all that now has a community with a lot of those people in it. And they've been able to do some amazing things with that community. For instance, they once uncovered in only three weeks the structure of an enzyme related to AIDS that had eluded scientists for over 15 years. So again, this is only one specific example, but I think there are lots of other things like that where some people, not just because they're experienced, but because of their own aptitudes are particularly doing, particularly good at doing particular things. And what we can do in this online world is find those people more easily and let them do the things they're really good at. So here's another example. It's something called the Human Diagnosis Project. It's a system that lets uh, doctors, nurses, and other medical clinicians get help on their difficult, uh, difficult patients, difficult cases. The way it works is they put in information about those cases, the patient's symptoms, lab test results, et cetera. And then they ask for advice from other people anywhere in the world. For instance, a doctor at Mass General Hospital here in Boston might get advice from uh, doctors at Stanford Medical Center. Or I think more interestingly, a nurse in a remote African village, hundreds of miles away from the nearest doctor, might be able to get advice from anyone anywhere in the world. So what they find when they use this system is that, uh, that Getting more opinions like this leads to more accurate diagnoses and better clinical care. They also, that's a result of the hyper-connectivity, the using a computer to connect people to others all over the world. They also find that when they use the system in this way, they build up a knowledge base of cases. And they've used artificial intelligence, machine learning, to look for patterns in those cases. What they found in doing that is that even with the relatively limited number of cases they have so far, the AI programs are able to be almost, not quite, but almost as accurate as individual human physicians in diagnosing the cases. So that's with only a limited number of cases. What I think is particularly interesting here is what will happen when systems like this have seen millions of cases far more than any human doctor could ever see in a lifetime. I think when that happens, it's quite likely that these systems will be able to give accurate diagnoses for many kinds of diseases. In fact, likely that they'll see diseases that we humans have never even noticed before. Tom, if, yes. if, I, may, if I may interrupt, we're getting many, many questions. Your remarks are stimulating a lot of thoughts among our audience. May I pose you a few at this time? Sure. Well, actually, let me just finish the story about human diagnosis, and then we'll do questions, okay? So, so I think that human diagnosis uh, uh, uses the artificial intelligence uh, uh, in ways that will be very useful. That's obviously a result of the AI capabilities of computers. But I think that um, uh, this, again, is another example of how you can use a combination of hyperconnectivity and artificial intelligence to do many different kinds of tasks, not just medical, as in this case, but lots of other things that we do. So yes, let's do some questions. Oh, so, so one question that has a lot of interest. What key cultural impediments have prevented the rise of remote work pre-COVID-19? what will have to change to ensure cultural adoption at many organizations? That's a fantastic question because I think that gets to the heart of the issue I, I want to talk about today. I think the cultural impediments that have prevented us from doing remote work in cases where it's now possible. Actually, let me first say that 
up until even the last year or two, there's still been some significant technical impediments to doing this. I think uh, just in the last year or two, video conferencing technology like what we're using today has passed over some kind of boundary where it's now good enough, scalable enough, easy enough to use that you really can use it for lots and lots of things. So in a sense, I think it's been technological limits in how to use these things and how easy they are to use that have inhibited us doing this up until quite recently. But I think the cultural impediments that remain, uh, some of them are just, we're not used to it. Uh, we, we don't know how, we don't like to do it. Um, I think part of that is due to limitations that remain in the technology. If, the, if there are delays in the audio, for instance, it's quite frustrating to talk to people when you can't judge by how quickly they're answering you, whether they agree or not. Some of those things are still frustrating and seeing everything on the screen is still frustrating compared to seeing people face to face. But I think over time, even those remaining things will get better. And it'll still be worth it to us to have face to face meetings for some things. But I think for more and more things, uh, just as in many cases, we'd make a phone call to someone across the country instead of getting on an airplane to do so, or we'd send them an email instead of traveling there in person. I think in many cases, this new technology will make it so much easier than it used to be that for many things, not all things, not all the time, but more and more things over time, we really will do them online. We really will do them remotely. And what I think is so interesting about the COVID pandemic, in spite of all the, the really terrible things about it, I think part of what's interesting about it is it has been a kind of bullet train to sort of jump us, to catapult us into this future that I think in the normal course of cultural adoption could well have taken a decade or more. Now that we've all seen how easy it is to do and what its positives and negatives are, I think many, many of us will do more and more of it now that we've been through this pandemic. Okay, I'm going to synthesize some questions because they have the same intention. Uh, there's a concern that a lot of what you've said, a lot of the assumptions about working and living uh, are directed to more developed countries, more affluent, uh, affluent populations. What about developing countries or populations in inner cities where this technology is not affordable or people are not as uh, comfortable and they're not as widespread? Will that continue to marginalize uh, these populations? Well, uh, yeah, I think that's a really important issue. Uh, I think that uh, certainly all the things I said about using technology to work remotely uh, depend on having the technology in the first place. And if you're in a country or uh, part of an inner city or, or something, some other situation where you don't have access to the technology, then I think that really is a limitation. It is a handicap on participating in these things. And I think, uh, uh, that will be a barrier and, a, and lead to delays in doing those things. Uh, in a certain sense, that's not unique about the technology. That's true for participating in many other kinds of economic and other activities. But I think to the degree we want to uh, reduce the uh, disadvantages that people in the developing world and in uh, inner cities and other places like that, to the degree we want to reduce the disadvantages they have, I think getting them connected to and familiar with using these technologies can be an opportunity for them to leapfrog uh, uh, into participation in this global economy. Uh, for instance, somebody in a remote African village who has no connections to the rest of the world is kind of limited by the opportunities in their village. But when that person is connected to the internet, uh, they might be able to uh, participate in online education and acquire all kinds of skills they wouldn't otherwise have. And in some cases, this is a kind of surprising result, but one that I think is pretty interesting. Um, in some cases, there might be people who have particular aptitudes, like a, a visual aptitude we were talking about in the protein folding example, uh, that don't require any particular education. It's just something about the way their mind works that they do better than a lot of other people. So if there are people with those kinds of aptitudes, 
uh, in remote African villages connected to the internet, they can potentially participate in the global economy using their unusual abilities uh, in a way that would never be possible without these remote connections. So another question. Living and working online works pretty well for so-called knowledge work, but how much of work is truly knowledge work? How much of work and learning requires physical engagement in the world and working with others in close proximity? And then another question related is what about uh, things that have uh, served us well in this situation like delivery services or manufacturing where, where presence is required? Yeah, so there's certainly still uh, a number, a large number of jobs in the world that require physical presence, uh, delivery services, um, uh, hands-on medical care, um, um, you know, getting your hair cut, um, uh, things like that certainly require physical presence today, and, and some of them will uh, forever. Um, I think there are uh, a couple of uh, interesting points to be made about this, however. One is that uh, some of those jobs that today we think of as requiring physical presence, like a doctor treating a patient, um, may in the future require a lot less physical presence than we usually assume. Here's another example about the COVID pandemic is a bullet train to the future in the sense that in the last month and a half, vast numbers of doctors have started doing telemedicine uh, at a scale they would never have done in the ordinary course of evolution for years. But they're finding that much of what they do in an office really can be done remotely when you have good video and good audio and things like that. Not everything, but some things. Um, uh, uh, I think even some very highly skilled things like surgery uh, can potentially be done with technologies like telerobotics. So you might have the skilled surgeon somewhere else in the world and operating a machine that's actually doing the physical activities of surgery in the same room with the patient. I think another thing that's likely to come with, happen with healthcare is that um, I think for many, many cases, many, many cases, uh, having a, a human in the room is useful for the patient feeling comfortable and even for the patient healing because of the social interaction, the social, the interpersonal caring they get from the person in the room. But the person who's good at being in the room and giving people a sense of being cared for well and someone taking, you know, taking an interest in them and doing all those and even the physical touch, the people who are good at that aren't necessarily the ones who are the best at making medical diagnoses and medical prescriptions. So it, it may well be that in medicine and potentially some of these other things, we have one person in the room who's skilled at the in-room interpersonal interaction and other people in a vast network all over the world potentially who are skilled at the other kinds of cognitive and data-based um, uh, analysis or whatever else decision-making is needed for the activity to be performed. So that's the first point. The second point about this is that not everything that can be done online is knowledge work. I think a lot of what can be done online is what you might call social work, interpersonal work, building relationships with other people, uh, kind of giving them a sense that you understand them, that you care about them, that their needs are being taken care of. You know, the kind of work that a party planner, or a cruise director, or for that matter, many managers do. Um, uh, that work is not exactly knowledge work, but it certainly can, in more and more cases, I think, be done online. So those are two thoughts about the question, which I think is a really good question. So one last question uh, before you go back. Uh, now that we've all spent so much time online and working virtually, how will we value isolation and time alone when we come back to being connected in real life? Now, uh, that's an interesting question. How do we value isolation and time alone when we're connected in real life? Well, many of us who've been alone have been connected electronically as much or probably even more than we were connected physically, you know, in person in the pre-pandemic world. 
So uh, I guess my first thought is that different people have different needs for how much time they spend interacting and how much time they spend alone. Um, and I think to some, to a large degree, that isn't changed by the mode of interaction. I think the, the needs I have for interacting with other people can be partly but not completely fulfilled by online interaction. Um, uh, so maybe there is some, some relationship there for the needs you have for interaction. If you can't get it at all in person, there is a need for that, which will be satisfied more when we go back to the, to the, the post-COVID world. Uh, but I think many people need to be alone, whether, you know, and, and I think the degree to which you want to be alone won't change a lot when we're online versus when we're offline. Okay, shall I keep going? Please. Okay, so uh, let's talk about another project called the Good Judgment Project. Uh, this is done mostly by people at University of Pennsylvania, part of a project funded by the U.S. intelligence community. The goal here is to predict uh, various geopolitical events, like uh, whether Brexit will be finalized by the end of this year. One way of doing that would be to take people who uh, are experts in these questions and ask them what they think. What the Good Judgment Project did was almost the opposite of that. They said, anyone who wants to on the internet is welcome to make these predictions. We won't pay you, it'll be a part-time job. And they let people make these predictions until the predictions either came true or didn't. And then they took the people whose predictions came true, the people who were in the top 2% based on the accuracy of their predictions. They put those people in groups of about a dozen people each to compare notes. And then they use some statistical techniques for combining the predictions from different people in these groups. They call the people in these groups super forecasters. Here's a picture of two of those people. This is a couple from Australia. One's an investment manager, the other's a management consultant. Uh, neither one of them was a world expert on anything about uh, geopolitical events, but they were both apparently pretty good at taking publicly available information, mostly from the internet, analyzing it logically and converting that into probabilistic predictions about what these different what these different events would occur. Now, it seems that they did a good job of it. These people did better than other people in general, but how do we judge the overall effectiveness of the group? It's not exactly obvious what to compare them to. But one intriguing suggestion comes from someone who was part of the US intelligence community and also knew about the Super Forecasters project. That person was quoted in the Washington Post as saying that the super forecasters performed about 30% better in terms of accuracy than the average for US intelligence community analysts who could read intercepts and had access to other kinds of top secret data. In other words, when you train, select, and combine the best forecasters from a more or less random online crowd of part-time workers, you get results that are substantially better than those from the multi-billion dollar apparatus of the entire US intelligence community. So I think that's a pretty interesting result. What could you do if you did even more than just random online people? What if you gave them special training and so forth? Uh, I think lots of companies and governments would be very happy to have predictions about things that matter to them that were as accurate as this. And I think in the increasingly online world that the COVID pandemic is leading us to, it may be possible for many more people to make a living from doing hyper-specialized tasks like this. Let me give you another example here of another way of making predictions, something called prediction markets. It's kind of like betting, but actually more like futures, buying futures on a futures exchange. In this situation, participants buy and sell predictions about possible future events. For instance, if you uh, think that the, uh, a given product is likely to sell between 1,500 and 1,600 units in September, you could buy shares of that prediction. And at the end of September, when the results are known, if you're right, and it is in that range, you'd get a dollar for every share you own. And if you're wrong, you get nothing for those shares. Now, it turns out that the prices between zero and 100 cents uh, reflect the probability the average probability estimates 
of the people participating in a market like this. It also turns out that prediction markets have been found to be almost always as accurate and often more accurate than other forecasting methods like product sales, like um, focus groups and opinion polls and so forth for predicting things like product sales and elections and so forth. For instance, here's an example of a public online prediction market to pre that predicts things like political events. Here's a recent uh, screen showing the prices in the prediction market for who will win the next US presidential election. It shows a 50% probability that Donald Trump will win, 44% for Joe Biden, et cetera. Uh, interestingly, you can see at the bottom of this page, the price history graph, which shows how those prices change over time. For instance, you can see there was a brief period right after the pandemic became big news when Biden was a little bit ahead of Donald Trump. Now they're still pretty close, but Trump is a little bit ahead of Biden. Uh, I think part of what's interesting about this is that these people aren't saying who they personally want to win. They're predicting who they think actually will win. They have a financial incentive for doing that accurately. And they do that is a way of get, and looking at these uh, results is a way of getting a very accurate estimate of what's likely to happen based on everything that's publicly known today. So an interesting, well, in this particular case, it's likely that these predictions in the prediction market are made by humans. But an interesting question is, what would happen if you combined people and computers to do this? That's a question a student of mine and I considered some years ago, a student named Iftak Nagar. It's, we wanted to predict things like what would an enemy do in wartime or what would a competitor do in business? But we wanted a simpler example. So we picked what would uh, likely be the next play in a football game. We showed people videos of a, a football game, stopped the video just before the next play, before a play began, and asked people to participate in a prediction market predicting where the next play would be a run or a pass. We also had some computer agents trained using machine learning on one previous football game to make this prediction based on simple information like what yard line the ball was on and how many yards to the next first down. Those agents participated in a prediction market with other computer agents. And then finally, we had some prediction markets where both people and computers participated in the same market. So a person wouldn't know whether the last trade was made by another person or by a computer. What happened was that we found that the combination of people and computers, as we had hoped, was both more accurate and more robust to errors than either people alone or computers alone. So this shows how prediction markets provide one way of combining the intelligence of people and computers that can sometimes lead to surprisingly good results. I think it's another example of how in the post-COVID world, there will likely be lots more work for people working online in various unusual combinations with computers. Now, the examples we've just seen are all examples of the kinds of work we will see more and more of in the post-COVID reality. And we've been working with companies like Deloitte Consulting and Takeda Pharmaceuticals and other groups to develop a systematic methodology for designing these kinds of innovative method possibilities. The methodology includes conceptual moves like those shown here. And I won't go into more details of the methodology today, but I will say that we've also been using this methodology to come up with innovative ways of dealing with the COVID pandemic itself. So this is a logical place to stop for questions, but I'm a little worried that we have only nine minutes left. Uh, Ken, let me ask if you think I should finish my slides or whether we should take a few questions before I do that. Well, uh, I can give you uh, one or two questions and then uh, if we can go beyond the hour, then we can continue. Okay. Your call. Uh, that's fine. Why don't you give me one question and then I'll do that and go on with other things. Okay. What will be the main skills required for organizations or future leaders to deal with in a remote workforce? Hmm. I guess the question is, what will be the difference in skills required? 
I mean, obviously a lot of the skills we have today will still be important, whether those are cognitive skills or interpersonal skills or, or manual skills. I think the, um, I guess the most obvious thing is that uh, to the degree more and more work is done online, skills in working online will become more and more important. Uh, I think another thing that's likely to change, as I've written about in some of my previous work, like the book Future of Work, is that more decision-making will be done in decentralized ways. And so I think the ability to work well with other people in more decentralized uh, combinations is likely to be more important than the ability to just play your role in a hierarchical pyramid, uh, which has been very important in the past. So those are a couple of quick thoughts about that question. Let me go on to talk about what should we do about the future of work? What should we do about the future of work in a world shaped by the COVID-19 pandemic? So there's some kind of obvious things about new kinds of products and services that companies or governments can provide. Uh, we need to fulfill short-term needs for things during the pandemic, like masks, ventilators, tracing the contacts of people who are infected so you can uh, deal appropriately with people who've been exposed, providing home delivery of groceries and lots of other things. In some ways, more interestingly, I think there's some long-term opportunities after the pandemic to develop products and services based on the kind of things we've just been talking about, like digital tools for working remotely, neighborhood office buildings, online versions of lots of things we do now in person, like education and concerts. But I think a question I'd like to spend the rest of the time talking about is not just what can individual organizations do, but what can we as a society do about the things that are happening in the COVID pandemic? The first example I wanna talk about is something that I just published an op-ed about yesterday in the Washington DC news site called The Hill. The idea is that we can treat the economic symptoms of massive unemployment caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, perhaps using an idea from the history of the Great Depression. The basic idea is to have a digital version of the program created by the US government in the 1930s called the Works Progress Administration, or the WPA. The WPA was a government program that provided government-funded jobs for millions of unemployed workers, most of them doing physical tasks like building roads, hospitals, and other kinds of public infrastructure. But today, we have an option that wasn't available in the 1930s. We can have a digital WPA, where the work done is digital, not physical. That also means, very importantly, the work can be done from anywhere, so it can still be done as long as we have to continue some form of social distancing, even if that's for some indefinite future. And this work also provides a bridge from unemployment today to the digital jobs of tomorrow. So what could these digital WPA workers do? Well, many of them, I think, could do tasks that are desperately needed to cope with the pandemic, like tracking the contacts of people who are infected uh, coordinating care for homebound seniors, uh, remote monitoring of various sorts for things like mobile security, cam um, security cameras in government buildings or x-ray scanners in airports. Other people might do detailed labor-intensive work needed to convert manual record, medical records to electronic ones. And lots and lots of other things are possible. Interestingly, another thing the original WPA did was include paying people to do various kinds of art, music, and other kinds of cultural work, like the nighttime symphonies shown on the right on this slide. In fact, they also supported a number of artists who later became household names, like Orson Welles, Saul Bellow, Jackson Pollock, etc. So what if today, instead of paying unemployment, we could pay a talented young musician who just got laid off from a job waiting tables to perform in one of the live online symphonies that are springing up during this lockdown period. The first thing needed for this digital work, of course, in addition to the funding, is the infrastructure for people to work from anywhere. We talked about that a little bit already today, and I think one possibility is that the workers who don't already have access to that infrastructure, perhaps part of that could be paid, part of the program could be paying for that kind of infrastructure. 
Another question is, how can we match workers to the work? One way of doing this is with traditional employment, whether that's by the government directly, as it was in the original WPA, or by companies who are paid by the government. But as the pandemic and the world evolves, there will also be many tasks that are desperately needed for a time, and then replaced by other newly urgent ones. So how can we manage these extremely dynamic needs? I think we'll still need people to manage the online workers, but today's online labor markets can greatly facilitate finding and recruiting workers in just this kind of ever-changing environment. For example, Amazon Mechanical Turk specializes in paying relatively unskilled workers to do small micro tasks like simple data validation, while other sites like Upwork, 99designs, and freelancer.com focus on larger tasks that require artistic, technical, or other skills. Now, whether or not these online labor markets keep the digital WPA tasks separately from other tasks on their platforms, there's an important potential advantage of using such platforms. And that is that un as unemployed workers do this work, they could become familiar with new ways of working online. And they might find more and more tasks they could do for other paying customers besides the government. In other words, they'd be learning new skills for the increasingly digital jobs that will emerge as our economy restarts after the pandemic subsides. Of course, a digital WPA isn't a panacea for all our unemployment problems. People in the 1930s sometimes joked that WPA stood for we poke along because they felt the WPA employees didn't work very hard. And it won't be trivial to determine the right mix of pay levels and work requirements to motivate workers while still providing incentives for them to return to the private sector when they can. And in this government supported version of a gig economy, it will also be important to avoid creating digital sweatshops and other things that are kind of undesirable, and instead to provide livable incomes and reasonable working conditions for the workers. And I think something like the WPA could be a very powerful treatment for the massive unemployment this pandemic is causing. So let me give you one other example of a project we're doing at MIT. We're planning to launch very soon something called the Pandemic Response CoLab, a, a way of helping individuals and groups work together online to solve practical problems created by this pandemic. By leveraging an open online collaboration platform, we hope to mobilize innovators, communities, businesses, and others to develop actionable solutions to real problems. For instance, we hope to uh, help people identify problems that need to be solved. For instance, anyone who wants to, uh, whether that's a person or a, or a company or a government or any other organization, anyone who wants to can identify what they think are pressing problems related to the pandemic. That uh, could be contact tracing, loss of jobs in the service industry, et cetera. And then, uh, eventually after these problems are identified and defined precisely, the online platform we expect will be able to help people develop solutions for those problems. Uh, for instance, there might be a challenge on how to do contact tracing, and people might submit new ideas like how to use closed circuit TV to do that, or in public places, or other things like that. And finally, in some cases, there'll be good ideas for how to solve the problems but some resources will still be needed. So the online platform could also be used to help recruit people or find funders or uh, discover where other resources that could be used are available. So the website for this uh, platform is shown there at the bottom of the screen. Uh, in fact, that's a link to an uh, open pa opening page that tells you about what's coming and lets you register to be notified whenever the site is officially online. So we hope many of you will be interested in participating in that. I'd just like to leave you with a thought. We've talked about many of the changes that are likely to happen and some of the things we could do about them in a world shaped by the COVID-19 bullet train. The thought I'd like to leave you with is this. I think there'll be many challenges in the world this train is taking us to. And like a train on a track, 
some of the places this train will take us are pretty much inevitable. But train tracks, whether they're for bullet trains or others, train tracks have switches in them. And we have some choices about which branches of the tracks we take. So my most important hope today is that we'll use our global collective intelligence to make those choices in ways that are not just smart, but also wise. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, uh, Tom, for your insights. Uh, before we close, may I ask you <clears throat> two questions? I regret that the, there are a hundred questions open, uh, indicating that your thoughts have provoked a lot of response among the audience. Great. One of them that comes up frequently is you have spent most of your time looking at work that is digitally focused. And so people who are working in manufacturing materials, uh, automotive for one, what does the future hold for them? How might their jobs change? Well, uh, some things will become more digital as we talked about, but as I said, there are also some jobs that are uh, inherently physical. And so those will still be need to be done physically. Uh, I think one thing, I didn't talk as much about it, it's not what I know the most about, but I think it's clear that many of our physical workplaces will need to be uh, redesigned uh, to take, uh, to be more uh, safe in a world where it's likely there will be some risks of COVID exposure for uh, quite some time to come. And even after the COVID epidemic, our pandemic is under control. Uh, I think it's likely that this won't be the last pandemic we see. So I think our workplaces and our work practices and our even perhaps our norms of how we greet each other in public, I think some of those things may change for a long time to come. Okay, and then a, a closing question, if I may, uh, which is maybe somewhat philosophical. What okay. advice might you give young people who are still, uh, who haven't finished their education? How might they prepare themselves for this uh, brave new world post-COVID or during COVID and post-COVID? And the second part of it is what advice will you give people who have been thrown into this maelstrom and are trying to orient themselves? How might they go about getting their bearings and planning a route forward? Great, an excellent question. I think the first thing I'd say to all those people is, of course it's not your fault and you shouldn't feel guilty about it, uh, but I think uh, it's possible to look at this from multiple points of view. One point of view is, oh, how terrible it is, everything will be awful, et cetera. Uh, but I'd like to suggest an analogy for thinking about this. It's the analogy of a forest fire. A forest fire is in many ways a terrible event. Uh, many plants and animals die in a forest fire. Uh, a whole landscape is drastically reshaped. But biologists know that without forest fires, forests can't really survive they become more and more risky uh, places to be, et cetera. So if we choose to look for them, there are some good things also in the changes that uh, uh, a bad thing like this pandemic will cause. Uh, so I think we need to learn how to uh, uh, accept our losses, uh, to leave jobs uh, or industries that don't have much future, uh, but also to look for new opportunities, uh, for uh, opportunities to deal in the short term with the pandemic, to take advantage of the new ways of doing things that are made possible by new technologies that we'll use more quickly than, other, than before. And also, since we will be rebuilding many organizations, perhaps even new uh, governmental structures and a new kind of society, I think it is an opportunity for all of us to think about uh, if we had to start over on some things, as we will, how would we like to build them differently? Okay, so thank you so much, Tom, 
for your thought-provoking and illuminating presentation and insight. 